Okay. Recording. I'll just send it to you afterwards. All right. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, sure. No problem. I'm going to, I'll start up the show and then we'll go from there. Okay. We're going to go live. Five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And we are back. You, hello. You are listening to Radio DePaul, Chicago's college connection. This is Games and Gavels. I'm Ryan Burns. My co host, Wesley, isn't here today. But I have a special guest here to talk to us today. Ross Scott from Recursive Farms is here. Hello. Um, and today we're just going to be talking about uh, his content and um, actually uh, mainly focusing on a uh, recent project of his uh, YouTube video called Games as a Service is a Fraud, uh, where he goes into a very long in-depth explanation on why Games as a Service is a fraud and um, actually goes through legal representations and con- conceptual explanations from it's for legal explanations it's phenomenal because he goes not only into american law but into eu law and australian law uh do you want to go ahead and try to uh sure the well i i it's i wouldn't call it phenomenal it's more like foot in the door is the best way to describe it okay the, the basic premise is games as a service or games where generally defined uh as ones where you have to connect online in order to run the game to a company server. Otherwise, they don't even function. And what the argument I was making on multiple levels is these really, I think there is room to interpret these. It's a big gray area in law. Like it's, this has not been tested, I don't think, in any court yeah, globally. Yeah, and, and this technology is relatively new, the way we're doing it now. Uh, but the argument I... Um, I don't know where to start. Okay, just keep it as simple as possible. Basically, these games run while you connect to the company server, but they inevitably stop doing that. And the vast majority of the time, as soon as they stop running that server, the game is with, the game's dead. It's or it's bricked. In other words, you have the client, but you can never run that again. And these are set up in such a way to actively prevent any measures to try to get them working again. And it's almost it's kind of like winning the lottery when efforts are made to actually restore them. They're by no means a sure thing. So the the idea is, you know, if you buy a copy of a game, you know, traditionally that means you own the game indefinitely. And what this what we're seeing is effectively a circumvention of ownership, where technically you own it, but if all value it has has been removed, it's I there's I think there are arguments to be to be made that it's kind of circumventing the law and this has not been tested because you're left with nothing at the end for what you paid for. And yeah. to get more specific on the law, the, the main argument I was seeing is that these games in some countries they're clear as day defined as goods like Canada. Australia, I think European Union, it's, it's fuzzier in the United States, but uh, they're essentially being run as services. So my argument for saying these were fraud is that it's essentially fraud against the government because if you're reporting that you're selling goods, but in reality you're running these as a service and they're skirting pr- normal protections, you would, consumer protections you would have as goods, then that's where the fraud comes in because they're selling them as something they're not. Uh, I, I can yeah. go off in various angles if, talking about something yeah. if you want me to. But. Um, it's kind of uh, interesting, uh, mainly the American angle, because right now um, it might actually possibly be challenged, um, but kind of in the weirdest way possible. In yeah. the U.S., uh, the, I, I sent you the link. Uh, there's a There's a company called John Deere. They make tractors and farm equipment. Well, they put proprietary software on their John Deere tractors with lockout chips so that if you tried to repair your tractor without going to a John Deere dealer or like a John Deere certified person, the tractor would brick. It would be it would be like a similar games as a service, but it would be it would be a physical good. Great. So there's now a there's now actually legal fights right now to try to make that illegal. And with that, it would also include software in a lot of cases. So there might be hope for the U.S. through legislation, like a, like a well-defined term. 
but it's coming from the oddest angle possible, <laughs> not video games or software, but farm equipment. <laughs> yeah. And it, uh... it's, I think it's maybe because like it's a physical good now that's actually being treated as the service rather than software, which is stuck in this gray area in the U S so that it actually, there's now a, like a, like an actual physical standing to fight against it. Yeah. So the, the issue is, is very similar actually with games. It, it, it's, it's different because with games, I think hands down, they're arguably less important than, you know, a farmer being able to you know, grow crops and depending on the tractor that he needs. However, from a consumer, it's actually even more anti-consumer than the tractor because you know, there still are ways to get the tractor functioning through the company or something. There is no such provision for games as a service. And I, actually, that's the whole reason that I'm fired up about this. Not because the companies might be breaking the law somewhere. It's because they're one of the few, this might be the only form of modern media without real world limitations that it's impossible to preserve. See, when, when these games go down, you are never going to be able to play them again. No one in the future is ever going to be able to play them again. And that's just, you know, if you look at things like music or video, books, there are ways to preserve them. You know, sometimes yeah. they, th 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 those can enter gray areas in the law, but the, the reality is you can find a way, whereas it's just not even possible with games, but to, um, with some of these games. But to uh, get to the... John Deere thing, I'm not, I'm actually not optimistic, even though the logic is extremely similar. Because the, actually, when I was doing my research, what I'm finding is that there actually looks like there might actually be precedent to prevent this sort of behavior in patent law. I, th I think Impression versus Lexmark was the case I was looking at. I, I found uh, out yeah. about that, where it says yeah. that, you know, they cannot basically change the funk, the behavior of it after the point of sale. And there, there's a lot of similarities between copyright law and patent law, but because it's different, oh, it doesn't count. Whereas I think the divide is even larger for other goods. See, that's the thing. Even if they make victories on right to repair, they may not impact anything on games as a service because, they'll, yeah. because in the United States, there's a lot of precedent to suggest that software this type are considered goods. You know, the, you know, software where you're not paying a subscription fee, you bought the copy of the game or, you know, of the software. And it's just supposed to, it's the way the vast majority of software has been throughout history. You know, that, that was one of the distinctions I made. There's, there were perpetual licenses where you kind of own it forever. And then there are subscription licenses where, you know, it's defined right from the beginning, okay, you pay for the software for 30 days or a year, and then you have to renew. Well, these, yeah. these are all sold, the ones, I'm, the ones I'm going after trying to legally are all sold under perpetual licenses, as in, you bought this, it's yours. Uh, so, yeah, the U.S., it might honestly be a lost cause. I'm still trying to look at, but... That doesn't necessarily have to stop the practice because let's say if like the European Union decided, yes, these are goods and these are violating consumer protection laws in you know the European Union, the cost to companies to not do this is so minimal that it would probably be worth it just to change the practice globally than to risk any fines in any large markets or pull out of those markets. But yeah, you were saying in your uh, video. Uh, that you that you like put down like a bare minimum that a company can shut down their servers, but they have to then release either the server code or some sort of server emulator or some even something, just some sort of code or some sort of representation so that some developer can either repair or try to have it just be played offline only so that it can actually still function in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, well, that would be the ideal. The, the actually releasing the server code or the client, that's not even the bare minimum option I presented. That, that's way beyond that. That would be great. Uh, no, the bare minimum option would be to remove encryption on the packets that are being sent, so you know, not to deliberately obfuscate information about how the data works and to release whatever packet documentation they have available. In other words, how, 
whatever information they have with how the client communicates with the server. This would not threat, and, and of course, and just to clear up any confusion, I'm not talking about releasing the intellectual property to the game. You know, they can, yeah. the company would, of course, retain the rights. I'm, I was proposing a, mi a minimum, yeah, I'll call it a minimum effort option because I talked to developers basically turning off the encryption and just releasing the packet documentation. Pretty much everyone I talked to agreed, uh, developers, that this would take anywhere from under an hour to a few days max if they were really badly organized. Because this documentation is something they kind of need to have just to operate the game on their end. And that that's still a long ways from having a functional game, but it doesn't make it even imp an impossible thing. In, in the video, I talk about how, you know, the way it is now, it's more like trying to, you know, to use Enigma to crack the code the Germans were using in World War II. And actually, some people came out after I said that and said, no, it's actually more complicated than that, the, yeah. the way we set up. See, that's the thing. It's not just that they're dropping all support. It's that they're leaving countermeasures to prevent all repair in addition to that. So, so like with the John Deere analogy, this would be like if you bought a tractor from John Deere, it has to constantly communicate with a server at John Deere's headquarters. They decide to shut that server down and they're preventing you from repairing, repairing your tractor. So it's yeah. like they're at fault on every level of this, essentially. To, I mean, it's, it's essentially acting like a rental that they're not telling you how long you can rent it for, but they're selling it to you as a good. Is, yeah. You know. I just brought up the, the right to repair movement because it seems like that's the closest thing of an actual movement or an actual foundation here in the United States against games as a service because um, most of – our American lawmakers are not the most technically inclined. Actually, the U.S. is going through a big issue right now where there's been a loot box law brought to the U.S. Senate floor. Yeah. And the senator who proposed that bill has never played video games. And the bill is so vague when it comes to what is a children's game and what is a loot box and what is a microtransaction. It could, in theory... Um, abolish all opportunity for expansion like all like even like expansions to games will become legal and all like really? standalone heard that. like it would the way that it's written is so vague that it actually could cause real harm in the u.s uh it seems unlikely to pass due to the um due to the lawmakers own party having control in the senate and even though there is apparently bipartisan support, it's very limited bipartisan support. Both sides are shooting it up and shooting it down. So it's a very odd, odd uh, debate going on right now in the U.S. It's kind of like the main, like, hot game news out yeah. here. And it's yeah. it creates just like an odd angle of we have people who have never played video games in their lives and can barely operate a telephone controlling complex law that could possibly ruin industries. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I was going to bet, I, I, I'd say it's unlikely to pass. See, see that's the other thing is, I th and I think that has a better odds of anything, any legislation along the lines that I'm talking about, because at least that one, politicians can understand, oh, they're marketing gambling to kids. Politicians get that. You know, yeah, th that's, th that's an issue that plays well. So that's, and they're like, well, whatever, my office will write up the, you know, the bill for it or, my so it, plays. whereas this one, I can, I can understand that, look, especially for a lot of issues politicians might have come across their desk. I can understand where this seems frivolous from their perspective because they are game. I mean, ultimately they are games. It, it still has kind of. I mean, as a game enthusiast, it still has a shock value to me to just see something utterly destroyed with no way to preserve it, and that yeah. people have paid for, and under a pretext, and under a standard that has existed for decades, where you know if you buy a good, you own the good, and have a reasonable chance to continue using it, barring acts of nature or you know some other unforeseen force. Uh, yeah. 
Whereas this is, it's a deliberate sort of pulling the rug out from under you af that in, 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 invariably happens. Yeah, I did a test of all like major games that I could find with some volunteers and the, the ratio with which, yeah, it was out of 122 games. I think I found, I think two, I want to say it was, I think there were five total that either gave a full refund. In other That's words, fine. you know, gave you all your money back because they took away all use of your game or they provided something to the again, consumer, either a client or source code. Although I think, I think I've been corrected since then. There were actually six. So that's still a success rate of six out of 122 titles, which was yeah, something like 95, 96%. You can never play the game again once support drops. Yeah. But, but yeah, with the loot boxes, I, you, you mentioned, I think the way that there might be a legal angle on this, most of the laws that apply to this were written b literally before it existed because I think the DMCA is the main kind of governing law regarding this, barring any other consumer protection laws that may exist. But games as a service has existed a lot longer than that, but those have all been subscription games, you know, like EverQuest, or I mentioned the, like the Sierra Network that goes yeah. way back in the video. Whereas, you know, you pay money and for 30 days you have access to the game. Uh, whereas, the the bulk of games like this are ones where you just buy them like in a in a store there is no subscription fee however they shut them down so i don't even know what the first ones of those are uh some early ones i know were battle forge and later dark sport but that was mid 2000s so that might have been like 10 years after the the dmca came out yeah it it really has not like as you said like it it really started to become mainstream right around the mid 2000s and it's practically almost a guarantee now for every triple a title yeah like a lot, a lot yeah like i'm thinking in my head right now like in the last six months of all the major titles that came out how many of them are games as a service destiny uh, not not Des well destiny 2 is games as a service. yeah it sure is uh, i mean the easy test is uh can you let, let's say you you get the game installed. You get it all set up. All right. Let well, I, I, it's a little more complicated than this, but th this is a test you can use for sure. Let's now unplug the internet. Can you run that game? Let, let's say you got it all installed, all they're patched up, ready to go. Now that in itself doesn't make it games as a service. Like, let's say the company. This is so rare. It almost. I'm not even sure it has happened. Let's say the company says, okay, we're going to keep it on this model, but you know what? Once we shut down the game, we'll release a patch so that you don't have to connect to the internet. Well, that's fine. You know, actually, I think, I don't think any of them have announced that upon release, maybe. That has happened in a few cases. I think the Sim, Sim City, the new one, like 2014 or something. I think they, I think they said they did It was have like, like that. Impact. And I think uh, Assassin's Creed 2 for PC started off like that, where you had to have a constant connection, but later they removed that. I'm, I'm not 100% on that though. But see, that's fine because then you're never denied access, you're never permanently denied access to your product then that you paid for. But we're not even doing that, you know, because yeah. there can be reasons to do this to prevent piracy or hacking or stuff, but if they're not selling the game, they're not supporting the game, and the customer gave them money to pr completely deny ever using that game again. Man, if you did that in some other industries, I'm pretty sure you would run afoul of the law at some point. I mean, maybe not in track. Again, this would be like the John Deere thing, except John you Deere. always had, they, they're the ones that stopped your tractor from working. J John Deere was, you know? Yeah. On purpose. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, I think just to finish up on this, it just seems like, as you said, the U.S. is kind of the lost cause when it comes to leading the charge on this fight. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of, de we're kind of depending on the European Union, Canada, and Australia. And if one of them makes a legal precedent, it will help out in an extremely large scale globally. Oh, yeah. Um, Union. If the European Union does it, it's over. Like, um, like this whole like loot box debacle. Like going back to loot box debacle started because of Belgium. 
Belgium passed the loot box laws, and because of that, the conversation then started in the rest of the European Union and the United States. I, I think really it was sure. going on before then, but Belgium was the first to really just say, no, it's not legal. Yeah, the, the first, like, legal representation, which then raised everyone's eyebrows. Yeah, I, I'd say it's, especially in the U.S., the odds are worse, I think, than loot boxes because, again, politicians understand gambling kids, fine, easy win, you know? Makes me look yeah, good. But, but in in countries where consumer laws are stronger, I think this might, if it can pass, see, just because Belgium passed those laws, that has not stopped loot boxes in any way because those are incredibly lucrative for these companies. Whereas this practice, we're talking the, the amount of money to have basically have an end of life plan for games like this is just absolutely minimal. Uh, again, I would estimate if it's done from the design phase, like knowing we need to have this or else we're going to get fined when we shut down the game and no one can ever play it again, I would estimate it's less than 1% of the total budget to do this. So this is the sort of thing where it could be a squeaky wheel gets the grease situation where if it's as long as any potential fines are a higher cost than the cost of having an end of life plan, that's all that's needed in order to maybe affect this globally. Yeah. But whereas with loot boxes, they're going to fight that every way they can, because that is just it's, tens of millions, if not tens of millions of dollars of lost, potentially lost revenue for them. So yeah, FIFA makes a billion dollars a year. Like yeah. each makes a billion dollars a year. Electronic Arts needs that money. They're losing money elsewhere. They need that money. <laughs> that, that's surefire money. They're gonna get. They're gonna get the six-year-old or like the person. It, exactly. Gonna they're gonna every year. They're gonna get it. They want it. <laughs> it's it's a surefire income that's gonna come in for minimal development costs because it's soccer. Whereas this soccer. primarily yeah. affects games, they are no longer selling. <laughs> you know, it's so. I mean. There's, there are some really fringe benefits to closing down the games, but it, it's so minimal. I, I mean, it, it's not like loot boxes in that sense. So may have more of a chance there, but I need to find, I, say I need to find lawyers or law students who know more about consumer law in other countries. I'm, I'm still yeah. sort of piecing it together for the U S what I'm, what, in general, I've talked to a few attorneys so far. The general look of it is that there may be an opening and there has been some agreement this is a gray area, but it sounds like the current precedent, it, it sounds like the judges aren't going to care. Like, like this isn't something they really want to This is not tackle something or make waves on. So, yeah. I mean, if that's the, see, when I say this is fraud, I think, I absolutely think there there is the argument to be made on that and this exists in a legal gray area. This hasn't gone to court. Like this specific issue has not gone to court. It's it, it kind of reminds me of Uber, you know, where they they would come along and oh, or th is this does this fit local taxi laws or well, wait they don't really apply here or are these contractors or employees? You couldn't say one way or the other, but or, or because the laws didn't cover this. However, you could certainly make the argument that hey, these are employees or hey, these are contractors. And that, yeah. that's kind of where I am with games services fraud in the U.S. In, in other countries, it might be stronger because the one of the harder parts getting these defined as goods has already been done. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's going to just be a reactionary thing. If if anybody starts discussing this issue, it will most likely spread throughout because it's going to like as soon as this topic probably gets discussed all the probably the major gaming outlets ign kotaku that kind of thing will probably focus on that and possibly raise attention to the issue and if we have another situation like belgium where there's an actual legislation placed it will most likely get the ball rolling even farther and it will encourage more legislation in throughout the world i think it's just somebody needs to start it as soon as somebody starts it it's a good it's a good well path it's forward. it's tricky i mean I, yeah, that's. I, I mean, I, that video did. I think it was like the second fastest viewed video I've ever had. I think it's over seven hundred thousand views. I affect. I, I had one person I know of. Well, maybe they, I don't 
want to say which it, it was at, at a game media outlet. I sent sent it to them. No response even. Uh, maybe I don't think this is a topic they particularly want to cover because it's so widespread. It would create kind of an uncomfortable precedent that might cause friction, but communication between them and publishers. I think if there's actual legal action being taken, then gaming media outlets might cover it. But just, and, and that's unfortunately a disadvantage I have is this sort of perpetually affects a minority of people. However, it's going to be different minorities for each game that this occurs to because these games usually get shut down once they've made most of their money and it's only a smaller number of people playing that's not worth it to the company to keep the servers running. So, and I found the biggest issues people tend to react to in gaming are uh, ones that affect them immediately, you know, as soon as they buy the game. Or in the case of loot boxes, that's something that's ongoing. You know, people may enjoy a game, but they're always getting reminders of the loot boxes. So that carries with it. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm more pessimistic on that front, but um, I'm just going to push this every way I'm able to. That's why I made the video, so... Um, well, this is not actually normally what you, what your normal, like, thing. You don't normally make these giant reactionary videos. What you mainly do is, um, currently Ross's Game Dungeon and Freeman's Mind. Do you want to sure. move on to that? Or... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, this is a detour for me. I did this because I, I think it's pretty much the worst thing going on in the games industry, except for maybe employee abuse, but that's a different set of laws, uh. Because, I mean, it's destroying games. It's that yeah. in ways it wasn't possible for. Yeah, I'd be happy to not be doing any of this. I was hoping. In fact, so yeah. I saw someone, another video titled, like, Games as a Service is a Plague. I was, I was hoping, oh, good, maybe somebody else is covering this, so I don't need to. And then, no, it wasn't. It, it was a, from a different angle. So, yeah, normally what I do are kind of, well, I, I sort of started off making sort of quirky comedies that were animated inside a game engine. That's what I'd like to get back to, but animation is an incredible amount of work. So I, I experimented with trying to do something faster. And Freeman's Mind is a series where, it's, they say a runaway experiment, where I, I'm playing through Half-Life and Gordon Freeman is one of the more famous silent protagonists in the game Industry. So I, I just fill, I just tried filling in every single thought he might be having. And that's turned into maybe the most popular thing I'll ever do. Uh, and Ross's Game Dungeon is a, it's a sort of rev game review show. It's more, I, I realized it's more like a, a gaming tour or safari where I try to find games I have thoughts on or, or can have interesting things to talk about and just... I, I don't know. It's a bit, it, it, I guess it's kind of an odd review show, I guess, or something like that. It's that I, I normally like to do kind of weird comedy stuff. So, um, When did you first realize that Freeman's Mind was going to be like your big calling or like your, like your main production? Like when did you realize like this is like a, a big thing for you? Uh, I don't know if there's, ever any one moment, it sort of went up like a gradual acceleration. Uh, well, I, I guess I was, at first, it was an experiment. So the first episode, I was expecting a lot of kind of negative feedback because it wasn't didn't have nearly production value as my stuff I did before that with animation. Uh, but I think once I saw that get more views than the previous stuff and they were mostly positive, that was good. And then later... It ended up getting millions of views, which even to this day, I don't think I fully process as real <laughs> in my mind. It's like seeing enough. It's not like, you know, you're, you're like going before like a band going before a concert or, a, you, you know, going to a movie theater packed with people. It, it's just you. See, there's numbers. You see some comments, but it's. Yeah, it's it's I, I can understand that viewpoint of like you like having a product and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, a million and a half people saw this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, but, but it, it's, it's a difficult number for me to process because I've never, you know, been around a million people who are, who want to 
look at something I did or talk to me or something. Yeah. So it, it's on a number of scale I don't quite process. I mean, the, I mean, the big, I, I think the, the closest experience I had to that was, I think I remember in middle school, there was an auditorium, a couple hundred kids, and I, I made a quick joke in the audience that got the entire auditorium to laugh. So I, th I think that was the closest I ever had to like, actually seeing the influence it's still a bit kind of disconnected on my um my brain here ever uh like while making freeman's mind like you ever like have like a like an episode that you started to work on and then all of a sudden you realized this is awful and like had to like scrap like multiple up like either like the entire episode or like a multiple episode block of like you building up an idea uh no i i tend to go through it too slowly for that to happen I'm, I might throw out a line, but oh, uh, actually, what, what will happen is I'll get into this sort of fog, and, and there's uh, there's actually an Onion article a while back that had a title like a uh, editor of America's funniest home videos can't tell if things are funny anymore, <laughs> you know, and because he's been editing so long, it's it's just kind of burned out part of his brain where he's not is is this good uh, like. I, I don't know. So I, I think I'll try to, some things I can tell are funny. Other things I don't know. I'll try to avoid anything that I think, or usually try to avoid. I have to make, come up with so many lines, but I'll usually try to avoid anything I think is kind of weak, but uh, I'll, I'll sometimes settle for bizarre or interesting. Like if, the, if I can just go off on a tangent and think, yeah, th this might be kind of interesting to listen to. Like a, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like putting daydreaming down into words sometimes. So, yeah. no, I haven't, I haven't had to throw out anything. I was like, from my viewpoint, <laughs> as someone what? who's watched a lot of the series, it, that, that you, I think you summed it up very well. It's daydreaming put into words. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's a, a skill cer school certainly helped develop because, you know, if you're, it's like if you ever had a class you're bored in and then you're just sitting there and it just starts spacing out, man, that's, that's turned to my half of my career now. I mean, <laughs> so I had a lot of practice just getting, I mean, pretty much all the trouble I ever got into in school is just from, as a result of being bored. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it tends to overflow with wh however my brain's wired. So th this is a way to just sort of <laughs> dump that out into a script or a video or something. Um. Recently, uh, over the past year, year and a half, you started work on Freeman's Mind 2, focusing on Half-Life 2. Yeah. Has, has there been, like, any, like, big, like, production differences between moving from Half-Life Source to Half-Life 2? Like, any, like, weird, like, quirks that, like, you kind of didn't realize what happened by switching games? Uh, not on a huge level, because I was using Half-Life Source, which is essentially Half-Life just recreated in the Source engine. So it's the same engine... There's always little things. Uh, I had a lot of trouble with the AI behavior of the Metro Cops, I think, at first, where they just wouldn't respond. Or I was trying to change the damage values because I, I try to make the whole series as though this is real for, you know, Freeman. It's tr and yeah. if you have to shoot every single person like five times, that, that sort of breaks the immersion some for me. Whereas, you know, even if you have a vest... If you get a few shots in you, you're at least going to go down, you know? Uh, so I tried to kind of tweak it to make it a little more believable, less gamey. Uh, recently, I had, yeah, I have some weird physics bugs, but that happened in the other ones. Yeah, in fact, I've started releasing bugs, of the releasing videos of the more entertaining bugs where I, like, I tripped on a cardboard box and that sends me flying down a hallway or another one, so I try to get out of a boat and the game just decides to flip me under upside down underwater. And m most recently, this one's a little scarier for me, but less entertaining, is uh, I, I normally record a demo, then export that to video frame by frame so I can do it at a high frame rate to add in motion blur. And this time it just decided to crash just straight to the desktop midway. And as long as I've been using the Source Engine, I've never seen it that happen. Normally if like the demo records and it plays back, it's always been good. And this is, I hope it's a temporary thing. <laughs> so 
there's always a million small bugs with Source Engine. Well, I mean, it's a 15 year old engine. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, well, and, and a lot, and it's uh, it, it's worse than that because it's it's heavily modified from the Gold Source Engine, which is used for Half Life, which is modified from the Quake One engine. I, I think John Carmack commented on Source Engine when Half Life Two came out that there was some Quake code in there. So we're talking, yeah. What was so that's more like uh, yeah, twenty three years old or something now. Okay, so we're 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 using a twenty year old framework for. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's been modified a lot, but man, it's... Well, I think even Gabe Newell made a comment saying that, uh, you know, Source, about Source Engine 2, you know, Source works for them, but, you know, other developers, you know, they, they might want to use Unity or something like that. Uh, yeah. In fact, for future animated projects, which I eventually want to get back to, I'm, I'm probably going to be using Unreal, so... Yeah, the only... Other games I can think of that use the Source Engine other than Valve games is the Titanfall series. Yeah, yeah, that one used it. And they use a extremely modified version of the Source Engine. Yeah, it's well, I feel like I feel like Valve sort of dropped the ball on that. Like, if they wanted to, they probably could have established more the engine more by making it. I mean, they they, they did and they didn't make it mod friendly. Like, they give you a lot to work with, but then. They wouldn't release like long-term stable versions or, you know, I think they just sort of backed off engaging the mod community and just kind of let everybody do whatever and just would let things up there rather than trying to actively promote things or try to get the engine. Well, Valve works in mysterious ways. So Yes, yes, they do. Um, for, I, I was just kind of wondering, this is probably, probably, uh, meaning this question for half-life 2 are you using like are you using like a disc copy of half-life 2 like a very early version of half-life 2 or are you just using like the standard steam version that's constantly being updated uh neither i when i decided to do go into half-life 2 i i actually have a real old i mean the disc wouldn't have mattered that if this comes back to the games as a service thing because uh, what i had actually was a backed up emulated copy of the old version and i tested that against like the most modern version, then there was like an enhancement mod. And what I found was the modern version, I tested it under different scenarios. In my opinion, it looked the best. They did some lighting tweaks and things like that, whereas the, the mod version kind of went a little overboard in some areas, I thought. So what I did was I I used, put it like this, it was the most, ver it was the most recent version at the time. And then I, I took those files down. I ran an emulator and now it's locked in. Like I, I am not changing that unless I have to, because man, when, when you're working at something, you do not want an update breaking things, which absolutely has happened in the past on the source engine. In fact, there was one point where it broke some of the software development kit for like a month, maybe even a couple months, but I, I had been intentionally working off an emulated copy just in case something like that happened. I felt like it was this, I, I felt like I was this sort of survivalist in this bunker, you know, ready <laughs> for this to happen. I mean, and, and the thing is, when I have bugs that just are big, occasionally I'll go back to the most recent copy just to test to see if they fixed that. And I, I want to say it's never fixed the particular bug I'm having, you know. So, that's, so, that's so yeah, it was recent as of a year or two ago, but you to lock down a version of the game oh yeah and, like oh, yeah. basically like stand back and go no one can touch this like, like yeah pretty this much i mean well look i mean if i was halfway through this and then there was an update and now the game doesn't work or hey my demo is corrupted now well how much work would i lose off of that or and hey i mean i'm not a programmer i may not have a way to you know repair that <laughs> or fix it yeah. or i might have to wait a few months, weeks, whatever for that. I mean, it's when you're on the development side of things, you don't want chances like that. I mean, if it's if it's a game you're just playing for fun, you think, oh, okay, well, I'll take a break and maybe play another game until they fix all this stuff. But if you're actually making something with it, you, that's just not a risk I want. You know, it's that's that's pretty much how I've always used computers for anything important. You know, I don't. I don't. I don't want big changes in the middle of things. So. 
I no, I can I completely understand you with that. Um, I think to maybe wrap up for today, uh, you are have for the last couple of years at least you've announced that you've been working on a movie. Yeah, of at least some caliber. You want to just describe that? To yeah, somebody? I'm not as far along as I want to be, but I'm absolutely still working on it. It's gonna be a machinima movie that it's kind of a mess because machinima it's the name of the medium you know videos made using a game engine or oh, games but it also can mean the company i just mean it as the medium uh <laughs> yeah well it's it's like kleenex you know if you yeah. say you know, any, any kleenex you know not necessarily meaning the actual company yeah. but uh yeah, I, I'm not giving too many details on it yet. It's going to be an unreal because, which has slowed me down, but it's kind of necessary. It, it, it's I knew it was going to be more work. It's going to be more work up front, but but once I actually get all the pipeline established, yes, it's, it'll go faster and more importantly, more reliably than Source. So I mean, if I had just jumped into Source, I could have made more progress, but then I might not. I might not ever be able to finish it because of the bugs I might run into. So I had to switch engines for it. It's gonna be, uh, the thing is I kind of hate animating. <laughs> I see it as a necessary evil. So I, yeah, before this, I was doing a series called Civil Protection where I would animate everything at source. So what I decided was if I never wanna animate again, I at least wanna get some of my absolute best stuff out there. Cause I feel like everything I've made up to this point has been almost a compromise usually on some level either between like you know quality versus getting something out in a sane amount of time so for the movie i'm just going with my best one of my best ideas it's going to be kind of a full kind of feature length movie animated it's going to be a advent comedy adventure thing i'm going to have it set in a medieval fantasy environment so a little bit different than what i've done but it, it th that's mostly because it fits the setting for like one of the I think it's one of the better ideas I've had for video. And I'm just going to try and make it the best thing I can. I'm, it's, it's, there, there's some hurdles I need to get through still, but once I get through those, then prog progress on it will be pretty steady. Well, um, I, I can understand why you don't want to really, like, divulge, like, the storyline or anything yet or, like, anything, any secrets like that. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm going to be tight lived on the story. I'm. I'm. I'll be completely open to technical details, though. So, I, I don't need to hide the tools. So that that's fine. <laughs> in fact, um, if anybody listening you... wants to help with, with, especially with things like uh, character model generation, that can also be rigged for for facial and body animations. Uh, I'm, I'm. I'm. That that's one part that's been hanging me up. You know, because if you play a game like. I mean, I, I know systems like this exist because even in games, something like The Sims or Skyrim, you know, when you're creating your character model, you can stretch the cheeks, you know, make the nose longer, that sort of thing. They share this underlying skeleton, but you can distort them enough they look like different people. Yeah. And I, I really need a system like that because there's going to be dozens of characters. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm, it, it's just not... It's, it's not a sane amount of work for my production level to, to, to just do each one individually. So that, that's one of my hangups right now. Uh, if, if I get that knocked out, then man, I've, it's going to be a lot of progress, like a train leaving the station. So. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Um, I'm guessing you're using Unreal Engine 4. Yeah. That's although that. this aspect is more engine independent. Unreal Engine 4 is just where it's all going to kind of come together for the, all right, so if, uh, well, I'm guessing any DePaul animation student might know something about Unreal Engine 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my email is rosswscottgmail.com if you want to contact and your me about that. Chrisfarms.com? Yeah, or, or chrisfarms.com. My email is there too. Um, I, I know DePaul is a pretty decent animation program. Um, I'm a game programming major myself, and I bet there's people out there who are willing to help. I'm guessing you've probably already yeah. got a lot of offers for help. Uh, some, but this is one of those things where, yes, I have got a lot of offers for help. I, it's the sort of thing where the easier or more common the task you need is, the more offers you get. And then once you get to the specialized stuff, man, you're, you're keeping your fingers crossed for that one person out of a thousand that'll help. I, I, 
I am getting some help on that, but I, I certainly would not mind backups. This has been such a, a big hurdle. Yeah, I was gonna say on Unreal, one of the first things I was so happy to see, th this is actually back on UDK, was, you know, before Unreal 4, was that you could download any version of the engine you wanted. <laughs> Like if they came out with a new version, okay, you can use that. But hey, let's say they introduced a bug in that and you wanted to go back to the old one. You can, <laughs> you know, you can't do that in stores without basically, sure. I mean, I say emulators, this stuff might technically be illegal, but I, I don't know. I'm not, it's not like I'm using it for illegal purposes. So I'm just, right. I, re I refuse to have an update break my game basically, or my tools. Well, the way that I've heard it for like your like the emulation legal argument is that as long as you own a legal copy of the game, you can alter the copy, your individual copy, going back to law. Yeah, it, so, it depends on the country you're in. It depend there can be specific details. I, I don't worry too much about that. Um, you I'm know, sure. see that that's the thing with like the games of the service thing. If this was just a legal barrier, then I, I wouldn't even worry about it. To be honest, because I'm just looking at this as a pre preservation aspect more than anything. Because for the longest time, especially in the U.S., it wasn't legal to circumvent DRM to preserve a game. And a lot of games we have, old games, we, we can run today. It's only possible because of piracy. Because the company either just didn't care or they went under or lost the code or something. Whereas the pirates cracked through the DRM, and that's the only working copy that survived because the industry basically just didn't care half the time. So, uh, I, yeah, I mean, that, that, and most of the time, again, the companies didn't care, so that's what's known as abandonware. Legally, I think there is no such definition of something as abandonware, but in real life, you know, if it's a game, the company's dead or it's something that the owners just don't even care if people are pirating and it's not for sale or anything. Well, then it's kind of a no harm, no foul situation in my eyes. So even though the law never really protected those, again, until more recently, uh, the games are getting preserved, so I wasn't worried about it. Whereas here, no, I'm seeing games destroyed that just that can never come back. So without... Again, without just Herculean efforts on it. Well, that's just about all the time we have for today. Uh, once again, Mr. Scott, thank you for coming on. It's been sure. an honor. And uh, this has been Games and Gavels. Uh, I'm Ryan Burns, and today is actually our last episode before we leave for the summer. Uh, we will most likely be back sometime this fall. Uh, I'll be posting on my social media, and most likely the Radio DePaul Facebook page will put on an announcement of our show schedule. And um, in the meanwhile, stay safe, stay beautiful. Thank you again. Bye. All right, we're off the air.